Today we are joined by Mr. Ram Madhav to have a quick peek at something that India confronts on a daily basis, uh, violent extremism and various shades of extremism uh, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, as Indians and, and the Indian state has to respond to. Mr. Ram Madhav, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Today is also Today is also particularly important because uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, foundation stone laying ceremony at uh, Ayodhya, the Ram Janmabhumi. We also mark one year of uh, India's decisions to um, uh, uh, make a political reorganization of its um, uh, uh, integration with Kashmir. Uh, and uh, uh, in some sense, one year ago and today marks uh, the emergence of a different texture of the Indian state. Uh, there, have been, there has been much written about. I am not going to uh, delve into that. You have seen both uh, the commentaries for and against both of these subjects. And I don't want to delve necessarily into the pros and cons of each one's arguments. But I want to ask you as a keen political watcher, what, are the, what is the nature of extremism that we confront today? And do you think Indian state's evolution in the recent past uh, is beginning to respond to it or maybe sometimes also uh, uh, in some sense create an ecosystem where we are seeing more polarization and divisions. Firstly, neither Ayodhya nor Jammu and Kashmir, namely, I mean, uh, especially the Article 370 decision, neither of them should be seen from the prism of uh, Hindu Muslim. One was a constitution related decision taken with respect to one particular state. The other was a, a historical, uh, uh, historical, uh, historical conflict that has finally been addressed to uh, India's highest court. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, these things should not be interpreted as though they are the flashpoint between Hindus and Muslims. Although on both sides there will be forces which try to interpret and try to uh, find fault lines. Uh, between the two communities having said it you know india's uh, terrorism problem uh, is uh, of course uh, as old as uh, i mean right from the time we became independent we have had this left-wing extremism and in the last 25 years we have seen the rise of uh, uh, the radical islamist uh, terror in uh, parts of the country so uh, uh, there are certain insurgent groups which used to be very active in the past in uh, some of the northeastern states. But if you look at the scenario today, except for uh, uh, the state of uh, Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir, even within Jammu and Kashmir, except for the Kashmir Valley uh, area and some pockets in central India, rest of the country, at least in the last five, six years, has been largely terror free. When I say largely Free, I am saying it based on the data available. For example, the last major terror incident in the in the heartland, in the uh, except for Kashmir and uh, uh, you know uh, northeast, the last incident was in 2013, the bomb blast in Bodh Gaya. Otherwise, we have been relatively free from terror in the last five six years. I see two reasons for it. Number one, of course, state in the last five six years has shown a different kind of sternness towards terror. To tackle terror, okay. state has to be very stern. If state is seen compromising, state is uh, seen buckling under the terrorist uh, pressure, then terrorism will only grow. Number two, most importantly, India, unlike other countries, is a country which offers equal rights and equal opportunities to all its people. Whether it is a Muslim, or a Christian, or a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or a Sikh, everybody enjoys equal rights in this country, equal opportunities in this country. I would go one step further and say that, you know, in India, there is positive discrimination in favor of the minorities here. That is why uh, terrorism, if it is to take root out of any oppressive kind of political climate, that doesn't exist in India. Having said it, there will be ideological movements, there will be certain political movements that believe in terror. Such movements can still impact or influence certain sections of the society. But largely the experience of India in all these years is, has been that neither the religious terrorist uh, movements nor the political movements could have greater influence over Indian youths. The reason I mentioned was largely because Indian youths find India's democracy to be sufficient to, you know, 
battle out their challenges and grievances sir um, you have uh, raised an issue about a stern state or a tough state in terms of response uh, how do you um, imagine or how do you estimate the impact what is your estimation of the impact of online radicalization on indian security we are also seeing today the internet being used to uh, propagate certain kind of uh, radical thoughts you are seeing certain indians from kerala take part in certain movements outside the country uh, how worried should we be that this rich digital ecosystem that we are investing into is also creating polarization division radicalization sometimes extremism and violence absolutely and it's a very important and very very contemporary challenge for all the democracies in the world you see just like democracies have matured progressed terrorism also has progressed to with the technology in 1990s if you recall the gulf war of 1990s the only source of information for us used to be the cnn and uh, look at what happened in uh, uh, 2000 uh, in early 2000s when the uh, i mean the afghan and iraq conflict happened you had the visuals live and from there today the terrorist organizations use the media the social media mainstream media to propagate and gain legitimacy in a certain section of the society they are today using not only digital but also virtual platforms that are they are using cyber space in a big way it is going to be a major challenge for all the democracies and all those who are combating terror we have to come up with ways of number one securing our cyber uh, cyber assets for towards that we need stricter laws and uh, more uh, stringent laws uh, number two we also have to compete in this narrative building you see i have handled kashmir the challenge that we used to face in kashmir was not that all the kashmiris are influenced by uh, the radical islamist propaganda but the radical islamist propaganda was uh, much much more uh, uh, spread across the state much more easily available than the other propaganda the propaganda of the country of the government it is here that the real race real challenge lies countries democracies how to now step up their efforts to number one deny the opportunity for these forces to exploit the new technologies especially the cyber space number two you have to come up with your own uh, you know your own tools of propaganda your own tools of uh, countering the uh, the arguments of the propaganda of the other side Sir, to ask you a couple of us on this particular aspect, let me at this time invite uh, uh, our uh, uh, audience to post their questions if they have some for you. I'm going to take two or three only. It's a short conversation, but do post your questions. We'll take the three most interesting and controversial ones to post to Mr. Madhav. But let me ask you two questions, sir. Uh, how, when you are trying to counter propaganda? So the propaganda is that India is not a safe country, is unfair to Muslims, is unfair to minorities, doesn't give equal opportunities. That is the propaganda that the uh, ICs and other Islamic uh, groups try to propagate to uh, uh, say attract certain constituencies. Similarly, the left wing ideologues will suggest that this is a very oppressive uh, feudal regime and very caste based anti uh, uh, people. So, you know, there are different uh, uh, in, uh, narratives that are built by different constituencies who are trying to attract people. Do you think the Indian state has developed a sophistication? to build a counter narrative without actually pushing people into the arms of the ideologues uh, it's a very sensitive uh, situation that uh, uh, that the democracies face you know on one hand you have this deluge of uh, onslaught happening uh, right. using all sorts of uh, you know uh, tools available and in many cases states are the sponsors of this propaganda then the challenge becomes much bigger much more daunting for uh, the democracies so this uh, at one level would sometimes force the democracies also, also to take to authoritarian measures in order to counter that i may find uh, it easy to rather block 4g in the kashmir valley completely uh, rather than trying to uh, i mean succeed in countering the negative propaganda but in the process i am actually denying the fundamental rights of the people also this is the kind of you know a razor edge walk that governments have to make so number one point that i make is governments should not be tempted by resorting 
with authoritarianism in order to counter another kind of authoritarian terrorism. Number one, that all of us have to be very careful about it. But having said it, number two, it is a very important dimension to which the entire administration's attention has to turn to. I have no hesitation in saying that even in a country like India, while the challenge is so big, are we fully equipped to tackle? I mean, uh, take on this cyber challenge, cyber security, do we have enough laws in place? Do we have enough sensitization in the government machinery? Um, I still uh, think that we have a long way to go. Governments have to equip uh, themselves in a big way to tackle this challenge. Sir, um, I, I think that's a fair point, uh, that we need to build capacity so that we don't have to resort to internet shutdowns. So, if I ask you uh, another important question for democracies uh, like India, you know, we get elected because we make certain promises, we build certain cadres, we build certain ar digital armies. Sometimes those armies capture the narrative. Do you sometimes think that uh, the the digital armies that are that become your cadres during uh, mobilizations required for electioneering and and democratic processes are also need to be communicated to so as to ensure we don't create a divide. Um, uh, uh, ecosystem in the digital space. Do you think we are always at war with each other on social media? I mean, I sit and watch social media. It seems that uh, you know China is in the uh, uh, is is on our border, is is threatening us. But Indians are having a go at each other. Do you sometimes feel that we have we never the electioneering is never ending? It is permanent polarization, permanent bickering, permanent antagonism. No, social media by its very nature is utterly democratic. So here lies a, a challenge also, but an opportunity also. Since uh, it is uh, completely in the hands of the individuals, they have freedom to articulate their views. In that sense, it is good from the point of view of any healthy democracy. But as you rightly pointed out, there can be this uh, whole danger of, uh, you know, certain uh, real armies, Certain, you know, today bots, you can create bots, the bots will fight on your behalf. So this, this technological challenge is also there in it. Uh, uh, you see, what today is happening is because of this kind of uh, uh, the... Yeah. It is putting pressure on the, on the political parties also in a way. We have been made, uh, we have been forced to become more accountable today. You, you cannot get away with the, uh, the kind of things you do and then you think that nobody will challenge me. It is no longer possible. So the, the kind of spread that we have is helping politics become more accountable, more transparent. But yes, in the process, sometimes those unhealthy elements, uh, unwholesome elements also sometimes get an opportunity to spread hatred, spread, uh, you know, bad thoughts. That is where responsible uh, groups, responsible organizations have to be careful. And of course, today, even the, even the companies themselves are taking measures to ensure that, you know, you cannot uh, cross my, the my, line. My question is, are political parties doing enough? Are you talking to your cadres to sensitize them in certain forms of communication? I think that is important. And I'm not going, I'm not uh, talking about BJP alone. I Absolutely. As far as, you know, as far as we are concerned, we make, I think uh, we, we always keep, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, the public discourse, especially on the social media, from our side, from the side of party functionaries and all, is it never crosses the red line. That, uh, that, is, that is questionable, but I think all parties uh, need to do more. I mean, you will agree with me that we have crossed uh, a few red lines in the past, but I think yes. the sensitization. Yeah, see, that's why we, that is the, uh, the reason for it is that this medium is so very democratic that you you just cannot control each and every voice that is there on the social media. I can tell you, we ourselves get a lot of brickbacks from our own supporters. If they are I, 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 witness, I witness the discourse every morning and I feel that why did I wake up. But let me ask you uh, uh, a question we have received uh, uh, from uh, the audience now. We have very interesting questions. We have a question from Ratna Deep Chakravarti. Uh, 
the question is that we have given legitimacy to certain narratives by incidents like Delhi riots. Uh, when an image of the riot ended in a magazine cover of ISIS, she's talking about the magazine that ISIS launched. How do we respond to this um, uh, uh, development when certain um, uh, in local incidents or domestic incidents become the basis of uh, capture of uh, uh, the mind space by outsiders or by external uh, bad actors? Uh, the terrorist groups are uh, their cohorts in uh, various countries. If they try to pick up something uh, in India and try to use it for their propaganda, then please don't blame the blame blame India or Indian system for that. If it is suppose if it is picked up by a legitimate organization outside and they are questioning you, yes. You are you have to respond to it. You, you are answerable to that. But a terrorist group will always try to look for certain uh, kind of a narrative to build on. It's not necessary that that narrative should be true. That is factual. Mostly these narratives are all false. You know, you mentioned about certain narratives about India, whether it is a fascist regime or it is an oppressive regime. It's all propaganda. India is one country which has seen governments changing at the drop of a hat. You know, we are we we seem very powerful uh, under Prime Minister Modi today, but we have lost six states in the last one one and a half years. Nobody in this democracy is invincible. That is the inherent power of our democracy. So this propaganda, they will do that. So we can't be held accountable for what ICC is publishing on uh, its cover page. Okay. We should simply dismiss it. So uh, on on a related question, I think something that you had mentioned earlier. Um, uh, the question here is that product um, that keeping the Kashmiri youth away from 4G services in fear of propaganda will we actually um, uh, serve the purpose or perhaps be the reason of will it be the reason of radicalizing more and more youth? No, firstly, not the fear of propaganda. It's a reality. It's, it's a general. The services, uh, the, 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 the internet services are used to spread uh, uh, no, some kind of a hatred, some kind of a, uh, I mean, motivate youths towards terror and all that is a reality in Kashmir. So we need to find ways of tackling it. Today, yes, we found uh, one way to uh, prevent it is to only allow 2G services not the 4G services. But eventually at some point we have to again uh, restore 4G. Then this challenge remains. So Indian state has to enhance its, uh, no, its capability uh, of tackling these kind of challenges. How do we tackle it is the question before the administration. The day we arrive at a good uh, answer, uh, the 4G will be available to everybody. So there is a, a question from Netra, Netra uh, Palepu, if I get the name right, and that is that you have spoken. In fact, she asks a broader question. We spoke about left wing extremism. Uh, how genuine is your concern about right wing extremism? And what is the government doing to manage both in Europe? Now they have a whole section and whole debate and whole study around because of their own past. So uh, what is the government? Is the government cognizant of this? Is government doing something about it? Both left wing extremism and right wing extremism. Firstly, this whole talk about right-wing terrorism, extremism, etc. is largely an, a, a, an academic creation. When I'm saying this, I'm saying it, it with responsibility because there is data available to talk about it. You know, not Indians. The Americans, the State Department, their agencies have done an extensive study of the terrorism, uh, uh, the elements of terrorism in India. You have the data which shows that in the last 15, uh, uh, last 20, uh, last 15 years, I think, uh, 20 years, 1994 to 2015, in the last 20 years, India has had 12,000 plus terror incidents that uh, can be attributed to left-wing terrorism. 10,000 plus terror incidents that can be attributed to Islam, radical Islamist terror. Around 50 incidents are what they have categorized as right-wing terror. About 50. It is non-existent. Even among these 50, most of them will be locally one caste and one minority community will be clashing. That will be portrayed as right-wing terror. Or there will be certain uh, forces which will be indulging in anti 
particular religion activity. There will be one or two instances. So it's not a pan-Indian phenomena. It's not as big as it is portrayed out to be. It is. Uh, uh, in fact, there is no such thing called Hindu terror in this country. There is something, sometimes a clash at the local level. Sometimes some people out of their uh, animosity for a particular religion, maybe Islam or some other religion, indulge in certain things which have to be condemned, they have to be punished, they have been punished. I mean, in all these cases, about 50 odd incidents, which are supposed to be right wing extremist incidents, everybody is punished today. They are all in jail. Uh, sir, um, uh, I. I, 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 there are two questions which are kind of related to this. So I'll just, uh, sorry to interrupt you. There is uh, uh, Radhika who, and uh, there is Shashank Ranjit, who both ask a similar question. Uh, they say that, uh, and they, they basically talk about uh, the very special day we are today, which is the, the day when we are doing the foundation stone laying ceremony for uh, uh, the, the, the Ayodhya temple, the Ram Mandir. Uh, they say that, is this, uh, does the day today, uh, symbolize the triumph of majoritarianism and you had already answered when you spoke about the court process so but this is the question uh, and does it challenge the social fabric of the country uh, do uh, minorities lose faith in the country um, and uh, i think radhika had a very uh, similar question that uh, uh, what is the relationship between this particular day and the fact that one year ago uh, uh, you uh, reorganized Kashmir, but also began the process of lockdowns and shutdowns in that state. So this is the, there are two people who are asking very similar questions. And I think you're the best person to respond to uh, uh, this uh, query. Yeah, number one, there is no triumphalism. Number two, there is no majoritarianism in it. This is I mean, I'm firstly talking about uh, the, the foundation laying ceremony for the Ram Temple today. This is the culmination of a long withdrawn process of legal scrutiny. After the process was completed, the Supreme Court of India, five judge bench of the five judges, there was one of the judges was a Muslim also unanimously gave the verdict in favor of that land being used to build a temple again. So when the temple is coming up there, it should be seen as a, a, a symbol of our collective efforts of the 1.3 billion Indians. There will be certain, uh, certain elements in all the religions which will still try to make it into a communal uh, kind of a conflict. But look at the response of the larger country in the last seven months ever since the judgment came. There was no triumphalism, there was no, there was no church stamping on the part of the Hindus. And most importantly, there was no, you know, uh, no, no shouting from the rooftops about injustice, no kind of communal propaganda, no kind of uh, street reaction from the Muslim community either. Everybody took it in a very sober and positive sense. Today, uh, as per the Supreme Court directive, a five acre land has been allocated to the Muslims to build another mosque just uh, away from Ayodhya and a, a, a committee for construction of that uh, mosque also has been formed. Once the Ram Temple work begins, the 1.3 billion Indians should come together, extend their good wishes for the coming up of that mosque also. That is about the first part. It's no majoritarianism, no triumphalism, but it is a victory for the value system uh, which uh, Bhagavan Ram represented. We should be, we should see it from that perspective only. But coming to this uh, date of August 5th, only significance is that they found a good muhurta on this day. The, the people involved in building the temple. Now, those who link it to Kashmir must remember certain facts. On 5th August 2019, the bill was introduced in the Lok Sabha. It was passed in Lok Sabha on that day, but it went before the Rajya Sabha on the 7th of August. So it's not just 5th which is important, 7th is also important. And I tell you something more, only it was the passing of the bill that had happened on, uh, on these days. The actual act was promulgated on 31st October 2019. So where is the connection between Kashmir? But okay, these dates are close to each other, but no, uh, no significance beyond that. Nick, sir, great. Uh, we have to conclude in the next few minutes. So I want to ask you an important question. Which luckily, Brigadier B.K. Khanna has also posed. 
Uh, and I want to put this in the larger context of fighting ideologies online, which are trying to divide the nation, create extremism, create violence, create clans. He says all political parties have uh, dirty tricks departments, which are used to attack uh, the opposite parties. Uh, he says this is deplorable and shows India in bad light. I will add, I will add, uh, this also is our weakness. The Chinese, the Pakistanis, our enemies can all use these internal uh, 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 propaganda narrative wars to ride on them and weaponize our public sphere. Uh, for me, in the sanctity of India's public sphere, our openness, our diversity, our argumentative nature, our loud and sometimes even contrarian conversations. Are you worried that because we have unleashed these digital trolls, I think the word is trolls, the troll armies, uh, are, uh, should we be worried about it as a country? No, firstly, in our party, we don't have any dirty tricks departments and all. I don't know about other parties. As I said earlier also, we do not allow our people, at least our cadres, to cross that uh, line of decency in public discourse. Uh, what we call as trolls are sometimes, uh, you know, to, uh, to us, uh, everybody, you face it, I face it. We all face it in uh, public life. No person in public life is above criticism. We are all uh, subjected to a daily scrutiny on the social media. I have no issue with that. Where we have issues is when they cross the line. Though their uh, responses have the potential to damage the uh, social harmony, communal goodwill, then yes, we all have to stand up and say this is not acceptable. As far as we are concerned, we are very clear that this far, no further. On that we are very clear. Uh, you have seen in the entire Ram Janmabhumi issue also, none of our leaders uh, has uh, uttered a single word that would have can, that can be construed as uh, anything to damage the uh, intercommunal relations in the country. We have to have that self-regulation uh, mechanism, self-veto. I missed the last part of your uh, uh, answer because I... Uh, had a bad connection. That's the life we live in. But sir, if you can repeat the last part for me so that I can conclude uh, uh, this session. Uh, 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 can we, oh, in fact, let me take and extend it a little further and ask you one more question. Do you think it is time that um, uh, political parties across party lines uh, in India, in democratic countries, take this issue phenomena seriously, that how uh, uh, insurgent ideologies can challenge democracy. And do you think uh, parties such as yours uh, and you personally should come up with a, um, a framework, a normative framework where we should all pledge to keep the digital conversations um, uh, uh, positive, uh, build community, build communities and build, uh, 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 you know, uh, amity amongst people. Uh, do you think it's time to now counter the hate and the negativity by promoting and projecting uh, positive stories of friendship, peace and, and, and uh, cohabitation? Of course, it is the responsibility of the every 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 citizen, especially it is the responsibility of the leaders in public life, whether it is intellectual leaders or the media leaders or the political leaders. Uh, I would probably draw one line though. In public life, you know, normal criticism, normal trolling is a part of the public life. When we when we see this uh, kind of acrimonious debate, we sometimes think in a very stereotypical manner. Like if a Hindu and a Muslim are arguing with each other in a very in a manner that you don't like, suppose they are arguing, we assume that the, that it has the potential for the Muslim to become a terrorist. No, it is not so. Hmm. It is not the social discourse that makes terrorists um, uh, uh, out of it. Hmm. Terrorists are made out of certain political, religious, our ideologies are certain very ex extensively oppressive atmosphere. But our problem is if there is a serious social discourse, social uh, serious discourse, we assume that you know if Muslims are oppressed, they will uh, it will lead to terrorism. We are and subconsciously we think that every Muslim is a potential terrorist. It's not so. I get your point and I also get your point that uh, social media is not uh, the whole world. You know, we believe just because we are having social media exchanges. But my fear is that as increasingly people live on social media, will it start affecting their real personalities as well? That's my problem because with work from home, all of us are always on social media. We don't meet people in real life anymore. We are only meeting digitally. 
uh, is our understanding of the other community other people becoming restricted to social media uh, 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 you know uh, exposure no not really not really that's specifically what i'm saying whatever uh, negative propaganda that you encounter on the social media if you are a wise person you are a, a sensible person you you know how to separate uh, uh, the negative propaganda and what to take uh, good from it but my larger point is the question that you are asking how do we tackle the challenge of radical element, terrorist elements trying to you know occupy this space exploit this technology to spread their influence or their domination that's a big challenge in which especially on the cyber security question we have to come together we all have to work together we all have to come up with uh, with certain you know mechanisms to kill this uh, cyber challenge it's going to be a very big challenge for the future thank you so much sir i think there is a degree of optimism uh, uh, in 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 your uh, comments this morning you believe that the idea of india is bigger than the social media debates that we hear uh, that the fabric and the strength of the indian fabric is stronger than uh, just what a few trolls can dismantle but you have also rightly pointed out that we need to uh, be more conscious and sensitive to uh, the narratives we build the indian state has to also uh, increase its capacity enhance its capacity to respond to the propaganda and of course uh, while the internet shutdown may be one of the tools to respond to the hijacking of the digital space we will have to look for more specific and surgical solutions in the future so with this uh, optimistic view that we as a state can respond to insurgent ideologies uh, let me thank uh, mr ram madhav ji for coming speaking about uh, all the issues that were posed to him very frankly and and uh, transparently and sir we look forward to having with you us soon uh, with you with us uh, with you with us soon again so thank you very much for joining us uh, we will be back with the kashmir panel stay tuned uh, on this ex- uh, interface for much more today on tackling insurgent ideologies 2020 and my colleague maya will be back with you in a while thank you very much sir thank you